It's the oldest land dispute in history. For centuries, Jews and Arabs have both claimed to be the rightful owners of the land of Israel. In part one, who is Israel? Calling Ephraim to come forth, we established that the rightful owner of the promised land is the father Yahuwah. The legal entity and treasurer of the land is Messiah Yahushua. And the trustee of the land is Ephraim, whom he received from Jacob. Since Israel recaptured the land from Jordan, it now belongs to Israel, according to international law. One judge on the International Court of Justice wrote the following about the 1967 war. A state acting in lawful exercise of its right of self-defense may seize and occupy foreign territory, as long as such seizure and occupation are necessary to its self-defense and where the prior holder of territory had seized that territory unlawfully. The state which subsequently takes that territory in the lawful exercise of self-defense has against that prior holder better title. Let Shamaim and earth be witnesses that the holder of the clear and free allodial title is Yahuwah. And the only judge and lawgiver is the scepter the branch, the servant of Yahuwah, who is the messenger of the covenant and the seed of Abraham. And in Messiah, we are of Abraham's seed. Yahuwah's promised land is not to be disputed by international law who favors the Rothschild banking families, who print the money for the whole world. We discovered and established that Ephraim is predominantly in the Christian communities throughout the four corners of the world and in other religions too. And if the Arabs are not the trustees of the land, and if the Jordanians are not the trustees of the land, and if Ephraim, who is the trustee of the land, is not in the land, then who is it that lives in the land now? My next question is, who and where is Edom? But first, let's hear what Judaism has to say about Edom. Esau, who in modern day terms is really basically, uh, you know, uh, certainly one of them is, is, is America. Esau became Edoim, which is a nation. Edoim became Rome. Instead of it being Rome, it became Christianity. Christianity, of course, ultimately became Western civilization. So Esau today is really Western civilization. But the new Rome, the United States, but the new Rome. Esau? Let us enter into prayer. Let us enter into the presence of Yahuwah. Father Yahuwah, we ask you to purge us and cleanse us with the blood of Yahushua HaMashiach as we wash our garments by keeping your commandments. Father, you have made us like sheep for food and have scattered us among the nations. Father, touch the hearts of your people who you have drawn here today and give them shalom and understanding. Father, save us from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Show compassion towards our fathers to remember your covenant, the oath which you swore to Abraham, our father. Father, we will serve you without fear in righteousness and in justice before you all the days of our lives. In Yahushua's name, Amen. We will continue to go deeper into who runs the state of Israel and who exactly lives there. But first, let us pick up where we left off in part one. In part one, we talked about the condition of the covenant. Let the record stand. Yahuwah has the first and the last word in all matters. In Genesis chapter 18 verse 19, this is where we find the condition of the covenant. For I know Abraham that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall guard the way of Yahuwah by doing righteousness and justice, that Yahuwah may bring upon Abraham that which he has promised of him. Beloved, if you can see, there are three Aleph Tavs, meaning that there is a deity here, meaning 
that it is the Messiah who is actually dealing with Abraham. And these are also covenant markers. Beloved, we are told that to enter into the promised land, we are to guard this condition of the covenant. However, most churches teach rapture to heaven and never covenant. Father will not change or alter his covenant word. Our Heavenly Father will not change or alter His covenant condition because of the lack of His knowledge, meaning our ignorance will destroy us. The original believers in the first century were called followers of the way, and this is the way that they kept in Messiah. We are also told in Deuteronomy 4, verse 27 and 28, that Yahuwah would scatter us into the nations for breaking this covenant condition and in the nations that we would serve mighty gods, which are the works of men's hands, the work of men's hands made with stone and wood, which neither see, hear, eat, or smell. Many of us today were part of this, and if not you, your parents or your grandparents, they were all Catholics. The question that I will pose to you, does the state of Israel guard the way of Yahuwah in Messiah as it is described here? If not, they are not scriptural Israel. Let us continue. We discovered in Genesis 22 verse 18 that in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be Baruch, because you have obeyed my voice. And this is reference to Abraham's seed, which is Messiah. And we know that Abraham kept and obeyed his voice, which is the book of the covenant. This is later confirmed in Galatians 3 verse 29. And if you are of Messiah, meaning the seed, then you are the seeds of Abraham, even heirs according to the promise. This beloved refers to the promised land. If we obey Yahushua's voice, we enter into his rest. What is meant by obeying his voice? Meaning we are to guard the covenant. Beloved family, the curse is for disobeying the law. There is only blessing for obedience. Beloved Mishpoka, mi gente, Hasatan has counterfeited, distorted, and usurped everything that Yahuwah has put into place. Because he wants to take his place in your temple bodies. He has counterfeited the covenant to a mere Christian Zionist gospel. He has confused the identity of Yahuwah's people. Therefore, most have an identity crisis. He has modified Yahuwah's creation as in the days of Noah. Satan has redefined people, places, and word definitions. Yet Yahuwah has always maintained a remnant, and he does not change. His definitions don't change. In this book, Benjamin H. Friedman, a Jewish man, writes about the Jews and reveals an interesting history. He states that the present Jews in Palestine are not the true descendants of the Judeans, but rather descendants of the Khazars. Benjamin H. Friedman claims that the word Jew was only introduced into the English language in the 18th century and that Jesus referred to himself as a Judean and not as a Jew. Inscribed upon the cross when Jesus was crucified were the Latin words Iesus Nazarenus Rex Iodeorum which means Jesus of Nazareth, ruler of the Judeans. Now this is fascinating. I went and checked it and it is so. <laughs> yes, it happens to be so. Now the word Jew today has a religious as well as a political connotation. You think of a Jewish entity, a government, but you also think of their religion incorporated at the same time. Whereas the term Judean is a geographic connotation. It's a geographic. It doesn't incorporate the religion. It's where he came from. He was from Judah. He was a Judean. Beloved, now we will go deeper. Beware the leaven of Herod. Herod was an Edomite. Edom rules Yehuda. 
In Matthew chapter 21 verse 43, Messiah Yahushua was rejected. And he said, For this reason I say unto you, the kingdom of Yahuwah will be taken from you, and it will be given to a people, a nation that produces its fruits, meaning the good figs, the wheat from all the nations, including the Zionist state. Beloved, Messiah is the scepter. He is the branch. He is the servant of Yahuwah. And he is the mediator of the everlasting covenant. And he's telling us that the nation of Israel has certain characteristics and it must produce certain fruits, fruits worthy of repentance. And if you don't have these characteristics, you are not Israel. And the scribes, Pharisees, and the Herods were not producing that fruit. And he told them, and the kingdom will be taken from you and be given to another people, a nation that produces its fruit. Can you comprehend the words of Messiah without the leaven that we have inherited? Beloved, I ask you to please come into this without any conceptions of what you've learned. Please listen to the words of Messiah of the scriptures and not mine. I am just a messenger. In Luke chapter 3 verse 8 and 9, John the Immerser, Yahukunan of the Teshuvah of the Tevilah, meaning of the repentance of the immersion, he told the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the time, and we're speaking to them today too. Therefore bear fruit worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say unto you that Elohim is able to raise up children, the seeds of Abraham, from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree that does not bear good fruit of the nation of Yasharel is cut down and thrown into the fire. Beloved, the rules have changed. Everything is through the Messiah. It is not by blood. It is not by race. It is by emunah. Faith, trust, and belief unto obedience to the author of salvation, which is Messiah. Now, Peter gives us an insight in 1 Peter 2, verse 5 and 6. He says, you are also living stones. These are the stones that John was talking about in Luke. He says, you are built up a spiritual house, a set-apart priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to Yahuwah through Yahushua HaMashiach our Melchizedek high priest because it is contained in the scripture in Isaiah 28 verse 16 behold I lay in Zion not Zionism a chief cornerstone chosen and precious he who believes he who hears and does in Messiah will not be disappointed it is all about the Messiah can you see that beloved And in Romans 9 verse 8, Shaul tells us, Those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of Yahuwah. For not all Israel is Yasharal, meaning in covenant status. If you are grafted in by the blood of the covenant by Messiah, and you break covenant because you committed adultery, then you are no longer in covenant status. You must make amends to Yahuwah your maker and return and beg him to let you back in into the covenant in matthew chapter 23 verse 13 and 15 yahushua gives them seven woes we're going to speak about three but woe unto you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for you shut the kingdom of Shamaim in people's faces. For you neither enter in yourselves nor permit those entering to go in. Enter in means enter into his rest. The seventh day millennial reign with Messiah. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you travel across the sea and across the land to make one single proselyte a convert to Judaism. 
And when he becomes a proselyte, a Jew, or a Noahide, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. And this is the same today. He further writes, the form of religious worship known as Phariseeism in Judea in the time of Jesus was a religious practice based exclusively upon the Talmud. The Talmud in the time of Jesus was the Magna Carta, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, all rolled into one of those who practiced Phariseeism. The Talmud today occupies the same relative position with respect to those who profess Judaism. So the rituals and rites that many of them observed were based on the Talmud and not on the Torah. In that illuminating treatise and that important subject by the most qualified authority at the time, Rabbi Morris N. Kurtzer stated, the Talmud consists of 63 books of legal, ethical, and historical writings of the ancient rabbis. It was edited five centuries after the birth of Jesus. It is a compendium of law and lore. It is the legal code which forms the basis of the Jewish religious law, and it is, note, the textbook used in the training of rabbis. So rabbis are trained according to the Talmud. And the Talmud has very little in common with the Bible. As to the origin of the present Jews in Palestine, he states that those Jews derived from Eastern Europe and many, many of the Jews that today live in the reconstituted state of Israel come from Eastern Europe are not descendants of the Judeans or the lost tribes of Israel but rather descendants of the Khazars. Who were they? They were a nation most people do not even know of. He writes, the so-called self-styled Jews in Eastern Europe in modern history cannot legitimately point to a single ancient ancestor who ever set even a foot on the soil of Palestine in the era of Bible history. What secret mysterious power has been able for countless generations to keep the origin and the history of the Khazars and the Khazar kingdom out of the history textbooks? Did you ever learn about it at school? I never learned about it. And out of classroom courses in history throughout the world, the origin and the history of Khazars and the Khazar kingdom are certainly incontestable historical facts. You have to do some cross-checking. Even the Jewish Encyclopedia is quite explicit about it. The State of Israel. The Zionist State of Israel was born in one day on the 15th day of May 1948. Satan invaded the promised land with Zionism, making the whole world believe that the state of Israel was the covenant nation of the scriptures. The father of lies is good, and many of you have swallowed that lie. So now you will learn the truth. What you do with it is up to you, beloved. The verse that has been used to support this lie is this one. Isaiah 66 verse 8 Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall a land be born in one day? Shall a nation be brought forth in a moment? For as soon as Zion travailed, she gave birth to her children. Beloved, there's an Aleph and a Tav, meaning the Messiah is present. This nation cannot be born without the Messiah and without Ephraim being in covenant status. This is why it's so important that the fullness of the Gentiles come in to be in covenant status. Today, you know that the woman is in travail. We can see and feel the birth pangs throughout the world. And she's about to have a child. 
The Messiah has already been born. She's going to have another child. That child is the man-child. And that child will be a witness of the cup of fury that Yahuwah will pour out to destroy the earth, to devastate it. And the man-child will be in the anointing of the Ruach and power of Eliyahu. Zion will give birth to the nation of Israel, the remnant, in the latter days. If the state who calls herself Israel was the nation of Yahuwah, which are the people of the covenant in Messiah, she wouldn't use the symbol of Saturn on her flag, which stands for Satan. And to make matters worse, why does she use the blue of the Zitzit, symbolizing Torah obedience, on her flag, when they are Talmudic in vain traditions of men, and her rabbis wear white Zitzits without the blue? Who are they really given honor and praise to? Zionism is a political and religious agenda that goes against Yahuwah, his son, the covenant, and his people. Most have been deceived because they do not know the true history of how it was created. They believe that this nation was founded by Yahuwah Elohim, which is Messiah, because of Isaiah 66 verse 8 to support their theory. To this date, the scripture has not been fulfilled. Ephraim, the prodigal son, lost his identity and he has no idea that he has the land trust to the land. This is why we are doing this video, beloved, to help Gentiles return to the ancient paths of the covenant of Abraham. Most Christians desire to go to heaven because of the doctrines of demons they've been taught in the seminaries through Zionism that they have sown in their denominations through the Schofield Bibles and John Darby's doctrines. Therefore, the people saying that they are the Yahudim are not and they do lie. In their own writings, they mention Gomer from the scriptures. Who is Gomer? Gomer is the son of Japheth, not Shem. The son of Gomer was Ashkenaz. And they are called Ashkenazi Jews. And they say Ashkenazi means Germany. It doesn't matter. Ashkenazi is not of Shem. It's of Gomer. So let's continue and go deeper. Yahuwah shall rescue Zion. In Micah 4, verse 6 and 7, it tells us that in that day, says Yahuwah, I will assemble that which is lame, and I will gather her that is driven away, that is scattered, and her which I have afflicted. And I will make her that was lame a remnant, and her that was cast far off a strong nation. This is the nation the Messiah was speaking of that will produce fruits of the nation of scriptural Israel. And Yahuwah shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth and forevermore. Is Messiah ruling from Mount Zion right now? No. So then... That nation is not scriptural Israel. For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word from Jerusalem, And that is found in Isaiah 2 verse 3. For here is the bride, the man-child. In these two verses, you see the bride, the man-child with Messiah living in Zion. In the Hebrew, Togomara means you will break her. Referring to the daughter of Zion, Messiah's bride which we are. Zionism wants the land and wants to replace Messiah to rule the world through the Noahide laws from Jerusalem as Ben-Gurion mentioned. And they're keeping true to their plan, beloved. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 14 And I will be found of you, says Yahuwah, and I will turn away your captivity and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, says Yahuwah, and I will bring you again to the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Beloved, these verses have the olive tovs, meaning that is Messiah, Yahushua, present, and these are covenant markers for His people. If you are in Messiah, you are His people and are obeying the covenant condition found in Genesis 18 verse 19. Let us continue. This is Jeremiah speaking of Edom. 
For behold, I will make you small among the nations, despised among men. The fearness and horror you inspire has deceived you, and the pride of your heart, you who live in the clefts of the rock, who hold the height of the hill, though you make your nest as high as the eagles, I will bring you down from there, declares Yahuwah. Let us continue. Obadiah says the same thing. Obadiah verse 1, 1. This is what Yahuwah Elohim, which is Messiah, says about Edom. Behold, I have made you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. Who fits this description, beloved? There's only one people that I know that fits this description. And they are tangled in with the, with the wheat. There are brothers and sisters and Sephardics mixed in this mess who are following their lead. That is why Messiah said, let the wheat and the tear grow together until the harvest. And Obadiah says, the pride of your heart has deceived you. And Obadiah continues to repeat the same words that Jeremiah told us. In 2 Ezra chapter 6, verse 9, Esdras, who was a Zadok high priest, tells us, For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that follows. We who are of Jacob, who have wrestled with the messenger of the covenant, and are keeping the condition of the covenant, will enter in the new world with Messiah, when he returns and sets up his kingdom. In Ezekiel verse 25 verse 12, it says, Thus says the Master Yahuwah, because that Edom has dealt against the house of Yahuda by taking vengeance and has greatly offended and revenged himself upon them. Therefore thus says Yahuwah Elohim, I will stretch out my hand against Edom and cut from it man and beast. According to the word, the spirit of Edom, physical and spiritual, will be destroyed by Yahushua. All right, so we're going to be reading from uh, this book, okay? It's an international bestseller, okay, by Shlomo San. The Invention of the Jewish People. That's the name of the book. And again, this is one of their own people saying that. It's not me. I didn't write this book. Fair use. It says here, Jewish Kagans, a strange empire rises in the East. In the middle of the 10th century, the Sephardic Golden Age, has Dai Ibn Shaprut, a physician and important statesman in the court of the Caliph of Cordoba, at Bar Rahman III, wrote a letter to the king of the Khazars, uh, Joseph ben Aron. Rumors about a great Jewish empire bordering on Eastern Europe had reached the Jewish elites at the continent's western end and aroused intense curiosity. Was there, at long last, a Jewish kingdom that was not subordinate to Muslim or Christian powers? The letter opens with a poem of praise for the king with an acrostic composed by Menahem ben Saruk, Hasdai's secretary and the leading Hebrew poet in the Iberian Peninsula, followed by the writer's introduction of himself, Interalia, of course, as a descendant of the exiles from Jerusalem, and a description of the kingdom in which he lives. Then he comes to the point, Merchants have told me that there is a kingdom of Jews called al Khazar, and I did not believe it because I thought they said this to please and approach me. I was puzzled about it until emissaries arrived from Constantinople with a gift from their king to our king, and I asked them about it. They assured me that this was the truth, that the kingdom is called al Khazar. You see that with the Al, before it was Khazar, al Khazar. And between Al Constantinople and their country, there was a journey of 15 days by sea. But on land, there are many nations between us. And the name of its king is Joseph. And I, when I heard this, was filled with force and my hands grew strong and my hope intensified and I bowed and made obeisance to the Lord of heaven. I searched for a faithful emissary to send to your land to find out the truth and to greet my Lord the king and his servants, our brothers. But it was difficult to do for the distance is very great. Hazai goes on to describe in detail all the difficulties entailed in dispatching the letter and finally asks direct questions. 
of what tribe is the king? What is the system of the monarchy? It is passed from father to son, as was done by the ancestors in the Torah. How big is the kingdom? How are its enemies? And over whom does it rule? Does war take precedence over the Sabbath? What is the country's climate? And so forth. Has thy curiosity has limitless, for which he apologized courteously. It is not known how long it took before the Khazar king's reply arrived. But in the extant letter, King Joseph answered Hazai's questions as best he could. He described his origin and boundaries of his kingdom. So the king of the Khazar says, You have asked of what nation and family and tribe we are. Know you that we are the sons of Japheth and his son Tukarma. Do you guys hear that? That's the king of the Khazar saying he is descendant of Japheth from his son Tukarma. It is said that in his time my ancestors were but a few, and the Lord granted them strength and boldness, and they fought with many great nations mightier than they were, and with God's help drove them out and inherited their country. Many generations passed until a king rose whose name was Bulan, a wise and God-fearing man who put all his trust in the Lord and removed all the sorcerers and idolaters from the country and lived under the Lord's wing. All right, so Bulan, we're going to read about him later on. This king summoned all his ministers and servants and told them all these things. They were content and accepted the king's judgment and entered under the wing of the Shekhina. Then rose a king of his offspring named Obadiah, a righteous and honest man who reformed the kingdom and set the law in the proper order and built synagogues and seminaries and brought in many of the sages of Israel. Writing in an epic and ornate style, the king describes the conversion to Judaism and lists the reasons that moved his ancestors to prefer the Jewish religion to the other two monotheistic faiths. In a tone suffused with fervent belief in the Torah and the commandments, he goes on to describe the location of his kingdom, its size, its population, and the power of his enemies and rivals, the Russians and the Ishmaelites. That leads us to the times of the Gentiles, beloved. We have Theodore Herschel, the founder of Zionism. We have John Hagee. And we have John Darby. Messiah foretells the destruction of Jerusalem. In Luke 21, verse 24, he tells us, They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles, by the non-covenant people, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. The non-covenant people are the people that are ruling and living in the land, the Ashkenazis. Now some of those are coming into Messiah. That is to say that Messiah is able to graft them in if they obey the covenant condition. So we're reaching out to everyone. We're not leaving no one behind. We're praying that everyone comes into the covenant. So let's review. According to Messiah, the authority in all matters. After 70 AD, the Gentiles will trample Jerusalem until the fullness of Ephraim comes in to covenant status. And this would happen at the end of the Great Tribulation. To trample underfoot means to tread underfoot, to tread with insult and contempt, to desecrate Jerusalem by devastation and outrage. Beloved, since Zionism came in into the land, there has nothing but peace in the Middle East. Scripture is fulfilling. Elohim has enlarged Japheth, and Japheth is dwelling in the tents of Shem. This is found in Genesis 9 verse 27. Scripture is true. Yahuwah has the first and the last word. Let us continue. The roots of Christian Zionism. They believe that the Most High blesses those who bless Israel that lives in the land right now and curses those who curse Israel. Number two, the Jewish people are God's chosen people. Number three, the promised land was given by Yah to the Jewish people as an everlasting inheritance. We have learned that there is a condition which they are not keeping. So when we go to the scriptures, we can see the lies. 
Number four, Jerusalem is the exclusive and undivided eternal capital of the Jewish people. Jewish people is just the tribe of Judah. Where are the other 11 tribes? Number five, the Jewish temple must be rebuilt before Yahushua returns. Beloved, if you do not know the history and the roots of Christian Zionism, it was the Christians who pushed the Ashkenazis into creating the state of Israel because of these seven things. So Satan was working on both sides to get this done. Number six, believers will soon be raptured to heaven before the end time battle of Armageddon. And this is what is taught in many churches. But the worst one, and the one that I come against so much by pastors, is number seven. That the Father Yahuwah has a separate plan for the Jewish people apart from the church. They say, that is not for us. That is for the Jews. That There's a plan for the Jews and there's a plan for the Gentiles. But that's not what scripture says, beloved. Scripture says there is no Jew, no Gentile, no free or no bond. We are all one in Messiah. One Messiah, one Father, one Ruach, one scriptural nation, and one covenant, beloved. Let us continue. This is from a book by Grace Hazel. And Mr. Don Wagner says this. That evangelical Christian Zionism is a political movement within the Protestant fundamentalist Christianity that views the modern state of Israel as the fulfillment of biblical prophecy, thus deserving our unconditional economic, moral, political, and theological support. And this is what we're seeing. And this next quote, you will realize why many support what is going on in the conflict in the Middle East right now. Mr. Halsell says, every act taken by Israel, meaning the Eskenazi Jews that control the state of Israel, is orchestrated by the Most High and should be condoned, supported, and even praised by the rest of all of us. Father Yahuwah is not a respecter of person, beloved. That is his land. And because the blood is being shed upon it, Wrath is coming. Nothing good is going to come out of this. There is no Zionism without Judaism. We will first start by laying down the foundation. And the rock of our foundation is in the Torah. Bereshit 49 verse 10. This is Israel, Yashorel, given the Barakat to Judah, Yehuda, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, to whom it belongs. Shiloh here is the Messiah. The Messiah is the branch, the servant with the rod of iron. He is the lawgiver of the Torah instructions for mankind, not just for the 12 tribes, but for everyone. And we are to walk and imitate the Shiloh, the Messiah. Because unto him the scepter belongs. Meaning the rod of iron, the measuring stick. And unto him shall the gathering of the obedient people be. Unto him a nation will be gathered. So let's go deeper and break this down. The Shiloh is the Messiah, who is the branch, the servant, and high priest of Yahuwah of the order of Melchizedek. He is the ultimate authority in all matters, according to what Genesis 49.10 is telling us. The people are those in Messiah by faith, trust, and belief unto obedience who hear and do with action. The obedient are those that guard the marriage terms and conditions of the covenant. They walk as Messiah walked. They imitate him. They are covered in the dust of their rabbi. The gathering together, the nation, is a second exodus to the promised land, not raptured to heaven as we have been taught in the churches. Let's review 
the branch or the scepter is the same word and it means from a family tree a household a congregation the branch is used as a staff as a scepter as a spear it is also used as an instrument of writing to implement judgment like the writer's inkhorn or a measuring rod a balance scale and to sum it all up in one verse it is found in Ephesians 2:19 where we derive our ministry name 219 ministers we are no longer strangers no more illegal aliens but we are now fellow citizens of the karushim the set apart ones and with the family members of the household of yahuwah to yahushua will be the obedience of the peoples the tongues the multitudes and they will be gathered together collectively as one people as one nation from all the 70 original nations and together they will be called Israel according to this verse the Messiah is the messenger of the covenant who is the giver of the Torah and he will implement justice and righteousness with a rod of iron the obedient covenant people from all the nations are the two sticks made one as the one new man and they will be guarding the covenant to be delivered, to be saved from the new world order when he destroys it. And beloved, I leave you with this word and pray that this encourages you, that you seek out this matter for yourselves and study it and that you be approved by the Father in all your ways, in all your thoughts, in all your actions. Beloved, Barukataya Hua, I leave you and Shalom.